Immediately after the end of the war, Prime Minister David Lloyd George announced a new guiding principle that no new war was conceivable for at least 10 years. So there was no need to fund military developments and the Royal Air Force would make do with war surplus aircraft. Overnight, the bottom fell out of the market and all unstarted government orders were cancelled. Sopwith had to reduce the workforce to around 1,400 and gave up the ham works, retrenching back to Canbury Park Road. Within a month of the armistice, Sopwith obtained a licence to build ABC motorcycles. Spare capacity was also turned over to producing car bodies and, to Harry Hawker's disgust, kitchen utensils. However, the main focus of the company remained on aircraft, and after the war there was an attempt to stimulate the civil market. The three-seater Sopwith Gnu, described as a touring and business aircraft, was devised with comfort and economy in mind. However, civil aircraft derived from military designs did not prove to be particularly comfortable or convenient. The Gnu was not a success and only nine were sold. The Antelope was the last design by Sopwith Aviation and was the company's only attempt at an airliner. It featured two wicker seats for passengers within a closed cabin in an attempt to provide a relaxing flight, a far cry from the comfort of modern airliners. In a bid to capitalise on the esteem the public held the company in, Sopwith opened a London showroom in South Moulton Street. The Antelope was also displayed at the Olympia Show. It was the only one ever built and ended its days in Australia, flying on postal routes. Attempting to revive interest in aviation, Sopwith built a long-range aircraft for an attempt on the first non-stop Atlantic crossing by air. This was in response to a pre-war offer by the Daily Mail of £10,000 for the first non-stop Atlantic flight. Harry Hawker and his navigator, Lieutenant Commander Mackenzie Grieve, took off from Newfoundland for the attempt on the 18th of May 1919. At first the attempt went well, with Hawker flying at 10,000 feet in good weather. Like most aircraft of the day, the Atlantic had no cockpit heating and the two aviators had to suffer the intense cold. Halfway across the Atlantic, the weather deteriorated and Hawker noticed that the radiator temperature was rising dangerously. A blockage had caused an engine to overheat, forcing him to ditch into the ocean. Fortunately, he managed to come down in sight of a Danish ship and was picked up. However, as the ship did not have a radio, it was at first thought in Britain that they had perished. Later, the remains of the salvaged aircraft were displayed on the roof of Selfridges. When Hawker and Mackenzie Grieve arrived back at King's Cross Station, 100,000 people came onto the streets of London to greet them. When the car taking them to the Royal Aero Club broke down and they got out to push, the police insisted on mounting the airmen on their horses for the rest of the journey. Later that year, Alcock and Brown made the first successful Atlantic crossing in a Vickers Vimy, demonstrating the potential of aircraft for long-distance flying. The historic flight from Newfoundland to Ireland ended rather ingloriously, in a peat bog. In 1920, Sopwith Aviation received a massive tax demand from the Inland Revenue for excess war profits. Sopwith offered to make a phased repayment over three years, but this was refused by the Treasury, forcing the layoff of the remaining 1,400 staff. So, despite the contribution the company had made to the war effort, it was effectively forced into liquidation by the government. Sopwith had to sell most of his Horsley Towers estate to pay his creditors in full. There was much comment in the press at the time attacking the government for neglecting the defence of the realm and forcing a national asset like Sopwith Aviation to close. The company was to rise from the ashes, 
but not under the same name. In November 1920, Sopwith, Hawker, Sigrist and two others each put up £5,000 to start a new company with the registered office at Canbury Park Road, Kingston. As Sopwith Aviation was still in the process of being wound up, a new name was needed. Harry Hawker was recently in the public eye from the Atlantic crossing attempt and so it was decided to call the new company H.G. Hawker Engineering, reflecting the esteem in which he was held by his colleagues. Fred Sigrist became managing director and the company ticked over by producing aluminium car bodies and its own motorcycles, which Hawker would then test drive around the factory. When Hawker was not flying, he satisfied his taste for speed by motor racing in his sunbeam. He was well known for rapid journeys between his home at Hook and Brooklands. It was decided to keep the new company small and only re-employ a few workers to build motorcycles. However, once again the gang had a business to run and their main interest was still in producing aircraft when the demand increased. They did pick up some aircraft work in relation to their old products. They produced spares for naval camels and had a contract for reconditioning snipes that were still in frontline service. On the 12th of July, 1921, Harry Hawker was killed whilst flying a Newport Goshawk aircraft at Hendon in preparation for the annual aerial derby. He was thrown from the burning wreckage and died soon afterwards. He was 32 years old. Hawker's sudden death was an enormous blow to the company and broke up the gang whose collaboration had been so successful. A tribute from the King read, The nation has lost one of its most distinguished airmen, who by his skill and daring has contributed much to the success of British aviation. Lloyd George wrote, to such pioneers we owed our supremacy during the war. Widely regarded as the finest pilot of his time, his funeral saw an outpouring of national grief. He is buried at St Paul's Church, Chessington.